and we'll talk right now to Richard Migliori, uh, one of the uh, winningest riders in certainly in uh, New York history and uh, one of really my favorites and, and so many people's favorites. Richie, thanks for joining us on Night School. Uh, thanks for having me. I just... Uh... A little precursor here. I'm a little bit sharper at 8:47 in the morning than I am at 8:47 at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a conversation with Rich today. We talked about uh, the Preakness with him, and uh, we also talked about some some jockey issues. And Rich, with this topic, I wanted you to offer the perspective for, particularly for horse players who are sometimes mystified watching riders fail to notice what's happening on the track when a a portion of the racetrack is good or bad and how much of a, a, a cognizance is there in the jocks room uh how quickly does a good jock uh, seize on how, what part of the racetrack is evolving to be good talk about it from your perspective well, I, I think your most successful jockeys pay very close attention to that stuff. They um, watch the races they're not in. They, they keep um, you know track of what's going on. Um, certainly, you know I think what happens to some riders when they don't uh, obviously pay attention to a bias is either they're not doing their homework or they've taken they're taking the path of least resistance, meaning. If let's say the rail is dead and everybody is you know fighting to be out in the three, four, five pass, and you see a guy down on the fence, well, that's because no one else is trying to occupy that position. So they're saying, well, okay, I'll just I'll go down here because I don't have to fight for my path. Um, and I think you see that quite often. Um, I also think that sometimes guys outsmart themselves. They think, well, you know, everybody else is staying out, but I'm not convinced it's, it's bad inside or. Um, you know, flip side, or it's not terrible outside, I'm going to go there and, um, you know, prove everybody wrong. And then usually what happens is they have egg on their face because the reason everybody's out in a certain position is that is the position to be in. And you see it quite often. I mean, years ago, Steve, at, at Belmont, you needed to be five wide. If you weren't five wide or more, you were in the wrong place. You see, you know, at Parks a great deal now. If, if you're inside, it's very hard to win. Um, and those are biases that aren't hard to pick up. It's the, the subtle ones when you, you see a change in the track. And that's when I think working horses in the morning uh, really comes into play. When you've been on horses and you've kind of got a feel for how the track is, I think you can make decisions quicker than the other guys. The, the factors that get involved, I made a reference this morning with Jeremy Rich that you, for instance, had uh, one of the, to me, one of the best wet track uh, feels uh, of anybody uh, when you would seek out that path where the the wheel, the right wheels of the tractor in the first path uh, would then be met by the left wheels on the second tractor and basically pack down a portion of a wet track. And I was still fairly new to the game, but I saw when you would turn and head for home, and you'd be out in about the three-and-a-half path. And it, 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 it didn't take me all that long to realize why you were there. Talk about things like that. Well, that was something that my boss, when I was a kid, Steve DeMauro, you know, kind of clued me into, and he told me, when you have a track that's muddy or a track that's sealed, pay attention to where the, the track the tire marks are because that's going to be packed down more. And if you can get on that path, you're going to have a big edge. So even before I rode my first race when I was 15 years old, I was already paying attention to that. And then a rider in New York who I thought was brilliant at it, and, and I recognized that even before I rode, was George Velasquez. And you would always see him head you know, to that spot. And basically... If you wanted to go inside of him, fine. Go down in the deeper stuff. If you wanted to come around him, fine. He was going to get on that path and make everybody adjust around him. So, you know, I was fortunate. I was brought up, you know, in a different era when, you know, trainers brought the jockeys around and basically, you know, schooled them and, and drilled certain things into your head. And 
um, that was something that always stuck with me, that if I could get on that track, I was going to, you know, have a big edge. And uh, that certainly it always helped if you rode a speed horse, Steve, because then you could pick your path. Um, I think sometimes people get lost um, criticizing jockeys about bias. When they're, well, why wasn't he here? Well, if you're not on a horse that you can basically define your own destiny, you know, find a place that um, you want to be, you know, if, if it's speed and, and there's a tire track and you're on a closer, well, by the time you get there, someone else is already occupying that position, so, and, and you can't change a horse's style. So uh, I, I think sometimes people need to understand it's, it's not like driving a car. You know, you still have to ride the horse to the horse's style, um, but if you're paying attention to bias and you can get to that position, well, of course it's an advantage. Jeremy. Rich, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, as a rider who... Yeah, you know, intuitively look for those spots on the track. Put yourself in the jocks room today, and, and who would the fans be looking at in the first or second race to see where they're riding on the track to try to get a feel for where the best part of the track would be? Like in Naira, I know you you know the colony well there, and the fans know those names pretty well. So who would you be looking at in the Naira colony as somebody who's a good judge of where to be on the track? Well, the two names that come instantly to mind are, are Johnny Velasquez and, and um, Javier Castellano. I think they're very, very in tune to it. But a rider that maybe some people don't even really correlate with New York racing yet, and they should, that really pays attention to bias, and I really think um, is a guy that's going to make an impact around here is Kendrick Carmouche. I think he is very tuned into bias. He he really is looking for an advantage. He's doing his homework. And uh, I, I think a very welcome addition to the New York Colony. Off the top of my head, those are the three guys right now in New York that if you want to get an idea of how the track's playing, watch how they ride the first two or three races. And I think they'll probably point you in the right direction. Great stuff. Thanks. Well, and, and Rich, in terms of, in terms of taking advantage of – maybe uh, some riders naivete uh, this is something i know that i've discussed with you and and have discussed certainly with tony uh, tony black i've seen some very uh, amazing rider maneuvers when it comes to uh, dead portions of the racetrack including the way a rider might come off the rail knowing off the turn knowing that the inside is is a sinkhole and that the the inner path is is a is a little too deep and and it bogs a horse down and they they'll come off the turn or tony does this famously at philadelphia and invites somebody to try to go inside to that that dead portion of the racetrack <laughs> and as soon as they do it their horse just sinks <laughs> and uh you know i i can i can picture you know you and tony laughing to yourselves as you've suckered some <laughs> some naive rider into into going into a bad part of the track well the thing with tony too is if he baited you up inside of you um, of him, I should say, he would then tighten you up so much he would put you in such an uncomfortable position that you, you basically wanted somebody else to make the first move at him. Because if they went inside of him, he was going to put them in close. If they went inside of outside of him, he was going to pack them out. But, um, you know, again, it, it's just about doing your homework and paying attention. And the guys that don't, because it's just so competitive. If you think about how many tools a rider has these days um you know years ago you didn't have a race replay center where you can go watch a horse's replay you had the form and and to get films on a horse was you know a, a, a big deal i mean so actually now to be able to watch horses races um really pay attention to track bias talk to the you know i used to talk to the track superintendent a great deal and and you know kind of get a feel for you know what was going on even before the races started if you don't take advantage, and this, this goes for jockeys, trainers, owners, horse players, if you don't take advantage for, of all the information that's available to you, someone else is, and they're going to get the best of it, and you're going to get the worst of it. It's about doing your homework, the due diligence, and making the effort, and it pays off. I mean, if you can win 
you know, a small percentage of races on the second or third or fourth best horse, just because you're paying attention, it's a huge, huge advantage. Hey, Richie, it's Kate, and, um I just there's a question on the applet that I think is a really, really good one, and that you can speak to directly from your experience riding in California. But the question is about whether bias can be dictated by the design of a track, how long the stretch, how quick the first turn, and how much does that factor into it? And the example was outside posts on the Santa Anita downhill turf seeming to have more of an advantage than the inside posts. Well, yeah, it's a great question. And hi, Kate, and I, I, I miss working with you. But um, <laughs> I miss you too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly that, that course, you know, in particular, if we take, just talk about the Downhill turf course, the El Camino Real turf course in Santa Anita. Um, post position is a, is a huge uh, factor in position and how races are run. And um, if you post one, basically you're starting on the far outside, and you you have to make that first right hand turn, which is a lot sharper than most people understand, and you lose a lot of ground there. And then as the field starts to fold over back left, if you're not in position, you get you run the risk of getting shuffled back. So uh, post one, two, three in a big field uh, is, is a big disadvantage on that turf course. Um, I, I think you know, the way I always approach races on a mile track was I always wanted to get my position going forward, you know, particularly a two-turn race. I didn't want to break out of the gate and have the flow of the race dictated to me. Now, it didn't mean I was you know, bent on going to the lead, but it did mean I wanted to come out running enough where the real speed horses had to go on, and it would create separation with the field, and then I could find a position I was happy with and then put my hands down and allow my horse to really get in a rhythm. I, you know, a race track like Belmont Park, obviously, you know, one-turn mile, mile and a 16th, mile and eighth, um, you're not in a hurry. You, you don't feel the necessity to, to come blasting, you know, out of the gate to make sure – you know, horses um, go on or take back. You, you, you basically allow a horse to gallop into the race, and, and that's the beauty of a racetrack like Belmont, but obviously it's a mile and a half. It's very, very unique. I do think people lose sight of the fact that uh, saving ground is important even at Belmont Park because you're on the turn that much longer. So if you're wide the entire turn, you're wide for five-sixteenths of a mile, almost three-eighths of a mile, and you have to be much the best, you know, to run that much extra ground. But um, I don't know if I'm answering the question as well as I should be, but in mile racetracks, I always thought position, I was much more position conscious, and I definitely try to get my position going forward. Rich, uh, another question from uh, from off of the, uh, the chat uh, in regards to uh, horses' uh, predilection for they're what essentially is the track that they train and, and the track that they're housed. It, it's kind of an interesting, it, particularly an interesting question given Belmont and frankly, given the three different racetracks in New York and the, the way in which, as some people have suggested, uh, horses that have run well at Saratoga uh, have had a history of, of running well at Aqueduct, uh, Belmont a bit of a standalone given the composition and given the, you know, the mile and a half oval. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, track layout and circumference and, and how uh, the consistency and, and track makeup uh, it can play into all of this. Wow, it's, it, it, it's actually covering a lot of ground, Steve. I mean, you think about, um, you know, Aqueduct and Saratoga, the one thing they have in common is um, basically, well, at Saratoga, you have seven furlongs, one turn, six furlongs, one turn, and then two turn races. The inner track just is six or less, and then two turn races. The main track, you know, has the, the mile uh, shoot. But, um, you know, it kind of makes sense that horses would excel. Um, it, it, it's a completely different kind of race to go a mile and 16th around one turn or a mile and eighth around one turn as opposed to, you know, two turns. Because a two-turn race, you're going to jump out of the gate, run to the first turn, and then everything moderates. So the, the pace of the race is going to slow down a great deal that quarter of a mile into that turn. 
So even if they go 23 and change, they're probably going to back up to about 48, 48 and change. Where a one-turn race at Belmont Park, and let's say a mile and eight just for the sake of math, um, if you jump out into 24 the first quarter, the second quarter is going to be faster because horses are going to build into that rhythm, into that stride, because they're on a straightaway. So they're probably going to go from a 24 quarter to a 23 quarter, and now it becomes a test of horses that have the ability to really stay. I think you'll see horses at Saratoga get two turns that aren't true distance horses or aqueduct that aren't true distance horses because of the way the, the pace is going to be meted out over the two turns, where they can't do that at Belmont. A horse has to have true stamina to go long at Belmont Park around one turn. The, 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 the race is actually going to pick up more in the middle than a, a, a two-turn race. So that's one factor. The other factor is I just think the consistency of Belmont Park, I mean, they call it Big Sandy for a reason. And it's quite a bit different than Saratoga. Not as different um, as Aqueduct, but there are subtle differences. Um, for years, Saratoga had a lot more clay. And it would get packed down. And particularly if we had muddy tracks, it would get very, very deep where it, it's definitely modified. I mean, Glenn Kozak and his crew do an amazing job of maintaining the three tracks. Um, but there was one year in Saratoga where it rained. We had a 24-day meet and it rained 21 days. And you couldn't wear enough goggles because of the clay content in it. The first 100 yards, you'd already gone through a pair of goggles. The, the, it would just come up and stick like, like glue. And, um, I mean, I remember Cordero Road, actually Pleasant Colony in the Travers that year, and um, left the jockey room with 10 pairs of goggles. And the first turn, he pulled the top pair down, and they all came down. And basically, you know, rode the race blind. So, you know, I think... Obviously, subtle differences in consistency of the track, but certainly the layout. Um, Belmont Park, you, you can't fake being a sprinter and get a, a distance at Belmont. You, you need to be a true distance horse to go, go along there. Well, Rich, uh, the opportunity for uh, these discussions in terms of what you talk about on the National Racing Report uh, and then, of course, uh, the trips and traps uh, with Andy, uh, the the best way from your perspective for players to plug into this conversation and, and understand what they're looking at, uh, when do you suggest people notice without somebody telling them and without somebody suggesting because sometimes you're listening to people who may not necessarily understand what they're looking at but when you're trying to determine it at what point do you think it's established that the racetrack is is playing decidedly in a certain direction whether it's a, a good inside or a, a strong rallying path outside well I, I think people get too hung up in if they see three or four races in a row or let's say a horse goes wire to wire on the rail they're screaming oh it's an inside speed bias but if they look closer and those are the three or three or four logical horses or you know horses that absolutely could win the race and they had speed um you know, you're not really learning anything. But if the best horses are winning just because it's their style, doesn't necessarily mean the racetrack's carrying them. I think if you see, you know, situations where horses that don't figure are hanging around longer than they should, again, just using inside speed as an example, um, that's when you can make more of a determination, not when logical horses are running well with that particular style. And, and I feel like there's always a rush to judgment with that. Um, but I do think paying attention to certain riders um, will clue you into bias sooner maybe than other people. Um, and, and for myself, I mean, I always did my own homework. I, I was a guy who liked to get on horses in the morning, and I usually had some um, you know, pretty strong opinions going into the day how the racetrack may or may not play. You now at Belmont, you know, when it's, you're not getting a lot of moisture in the track, or if it's, let's say, windy, where when they're watering the track and it's drying out quicker, it's always seemed to me outside horses had an edge, horses closing had an edge, because the track just would get cuppy and t more tiring, and speed horses would have a, a tougher time going to the lead, especially towards the rail. 
and holding on. So I do think if you pay attention to certain tracks and how weather conditions affect those tracks, um, but again, that's an individual thing where if you do the homework, you're definitely going to come up and see some patterns. Well, we see uh, patterns uh, in the excellence of Rich Migliori's work for Fox Sports 1, of course, the Jockey Club Tour on Fox. When's the next show, Rich? Um, July 5th down at Mama's Park, the uh, United Nations. Outstanding. And, uh, in fact, uh, had Todd Pletcher on today, and he's going to uh, spin back with Winning Cause. He's going to leave Winning Cause uh <laughs> he's going to leave him in Monmouth all all summer. Uh, <laughs> he's going to go after the Monmouth Stakes and then the United Nations and and then I think there's the Ocean Port after that. So uh, uh, and a grand motion, of course, uh, looking at uh, a United Nations again uh, with um, oh my gosh, made sequence, made sequence. Well, he's you know, he's been out of sight actually here for. Uh, you know, since uh, since Dubai, nobody's really talked much about him. And uh, Rich, of course, uh, we're getting ready for uh, this 15-day lead-up now. Uh, seven, how many days we got? Uh, 15, 16, 14, 15, 16 days uh, as of tomorrow leading into a Belmont Stakes uh, Triple Crown try. Yet another one. Uh, too early to ask you for a, uh, for a definitive answer, but it uh, feels like some people are pretty well convinced that uh, that this is a horse that seems to have a, an honest, a very good, honest try, chance at this. We're due, Steve. We're definitely due. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were due for a visit from Rich Migliori on night school, and uh, uh, we, uh, I guess we're, number one, we're lucky that the Rangers weren't playing, number one. That was the, the first, uh, <laughs> that was the first order of business, and uh, uh, also that wasn't so late that we couldn't get you on, and uh, good luck to the, uh, to the Broadway Blues uh, going forward, Rich. Yeah, absolutely. That's the way they played last night. We need them to get back to their game, but uh, appreciate you guys having me on, and I'm glad I could do it.